Welcome to Frank Stajano Explains and to the Algorithms course at the University of Cambridge. One thing we do a lot while studying algorithms is to estimate how long they take to run. I'm pretty sure you've been exposed to asymptotic complexity before in some of the other first year courses you did before this one, and possibly even before coming to university. In my experience, however, it is a topic that a good fraction of you finds a bit nebulous, so it's worth going over it again to make the concepts clear. We're going to be using these ideas a lot in the rest of the course, and so we should dispel any doubts now. We want to be able to express the cost of an algorithm, specifically the time it takes to run, as a function of the size of its input. In particular, we want to know how fast the running time grows when the size of the input grows. We don't want a precise answer that is specific to a particular input or to a particular computer. We want a less precise but more general kind of answer that will continue to be valid across all inputs and across a wide range of computers. So we make simplifications, we ignore many details, we look at uh, the asymptotic growth rate for very large n, and we only analyze the worst case rather than the average case, not least because we usually don't know the probability distribution of the possible inputs, but also because for certain applications we want firm guarantees that the behavior of the algorithm is never going to be worse than our stated bound. Despite all these simplifications, asymptotic complexity still gives remarkably useful results in practice. In the handout we go into greater detail into this issue than we have time for here, and in chapter 3 of your Introduction to Algorithms textbook there is more detail still. Here, to keep the videos to a manageable length, I just give you the core ideas by piecing together the best parts from some of my live lectures. In addition, I've also recorded in the studio a lengthier worked example that lets us explore some extra subtleties to do with these definitions. Those who just want to do the bare minimum and not exceed the number of lecture hours promised in the lecture course description are free to skip this, this extra, and uh, I won't include it in the official algorithms course playlist. Those who are interested in fully owning uh, this topic are instead welcome to take advantage of the optional extra. As ever, if these explanations are useful to you, please drop a thumbs up on this video. Please understand these definitions and the associated formulae instead of memorizing them. They are not particularly difficult, but you must absolutely be able to rederive them and justify them yourself and apply them to specific cases by identifying the relevant constants. We are going to consider this complexity, which I'm sure you've already seen uh, to some extent in the foundations course. Uh, I ignore all the details, and what remains is what? What remains is the order of growth, in the sense that if I have a function of n that tells me the uh, cost, the, the time cost of running my algorithm is uh, 24 n to the seventh uh, plus 1,000 and to the fourth uh, plus other things like that. Then, and I may have a function that does plenty of squiggly things. The higher the degree, the more it can be squiggly. And it doesn't even have to be a polynomial. It can be something else. Uh, but it's a function that grows with time. And as it grows, I really don't care about all the squiggles. I only care about uh, how fast it goes up. And so if I'm trying to say um, the cost of this, I don't know exactly, but let's just be safe. It's not going to exceed that. Then I am putting a cap. I'm putting a kind of a bound on the cost, saying uh, it will always be dominated by something simpler. So I'm going to write a function g g of n has the property that it's a lot easier to write. For example, 
n to the 10th, right? Uh, and g of n is a bound for f of n in the sense that um, g of n will always win over f of n. Well, it's not true because this has a 24 in here, and so uh, at some point, uh, this 24 n to the seventh, uh, for example, when uh, n equals 1, uh, is greater than n to the 10. Uh, but if you go sufficiently far to uh, the right, there will always be a point where n to the 10th wins over here, even if this is not 24, but it's 24 million, right? At some point, this will always win. And so I ignore all the uh, lower uh, terms, and I, and I consider just this. Now, this uh, is true that we'll always beat it, but it's not um, as tight a bound as I might have, as you realize. You could have n to the ninth, n to the eighth. In fact, you could have n to the seven. You could have n to the seven, and you would be able to say that uh, you can always uh, dominate this thing with an n to the seven, provided you put a uh, right number in front. This will never exceed. So if we look at things in this way, uh, you get out of my way. You too. This is a picture from your wonderful textbook. So f of n is the squiggly one that may be more complicated than I like. And g of n is the one that should be simpler and uh, easier to write down and smooth. It doesn't look especially smooth here. But what I'm doing is I'm sandwiching f of n between two copies of g of n multiplied by two uh, constants, c1 and c2. So regardless of what happens at the beginning, if I can say that from some point onwards, from some point onwards, it is always the case that f of n is contained between g of n multiplied by a constant and g of n multiplied by another constant, then the order of growth of f of n is the same as g of n. And I say f of n is equal big theta of g of n. And really, big theta of g of n is a set of functions that all comply with staying within, um, within two versions of g of n multiplied by different factors. Uh, and so it should really be not an equal sign, but a uh, set in sign. So it should be this sign. Have you seen this sign yet, or are you still to come? You've seen this sign. OK. So it should be this. But the convention is to uh, write equal. So we'll, we'll also write equal, but it's, it's slightly improper. So what this really means is this. f of n belongs to the set of um, theta of g of n if and only if there exist these constants. And 0 is a number from which onwards the property holds. So from n0 onwards, and c1 and c2 are the, the coefficients of g of n, um, For all n that are greater than n0, then f of n is contained between c1 g of n and c2 g of n. We are making all these things greater than 0 uh, to avoid complications that would make uh, all these definitions uh, needlessly messy. All these things grow because you're accumulating more time as, as time goes on, so it's not a big deal. Um, if I only care about saying, I'm going to put an upper bound on the growth of f of n, then I only care about this one. I can remove this part. And then instead of calling it big theta, I call it big O. So the big O is when you delete this part of the constraint. And you only have f of n is less than or equal c2 g of n. Uh, there exists some n0 from where, from where onwards. Uh, I can dominate f of n with g of n. With a suitable multiplier in front, I don't care. Uh, I may also say, um, sorry, so the, this is the big O, which is the one that is most frequently used. You just give a, an upper bound. You give an upper bound 
in the pessimistic case, well, you say you could cost the function uh, very carefully, but it depends on the input. I mean, even for an input of a given size, if any for the input of size six that we had earlier, how long does it take to run in search sort? Well, it depends because if I have to move around a lot in the, I will always run the outer loop uh, for as many times as there are items. But the inner loop, I might run more times if things have to go back to the beginning and not so many times if they're already near the end. In fact, in the limit, if I, if I receive an array that's already sorted, I have to run the outer loop n times, but the inner loop never runs because I, I always say you're already where you should be. And so for an already sorted array, it goes much faster than for a reverse sorted array. But in this course, I take the view of always looking for the worst case. So um, if I do the analysis for the worst case, I can simplify things, uh, and I can always have a guarantee that whatever I do, I'm not going to exceed the bound that I develop, and I can dimension my computing resources for that. So the big O of n is used uh, in that sense. Just put the boundary. Now, notice that this big O of n, like I had in the example earlier, it could be a bound that is not tight. You could say n to the 10th is b uh, a function that grows like n to the 7th is big O of uh, n to the tenth, but uh, that's not always useful. Whereas the theta, because it bounds it from above and also from below, is exactly the same growth rate. Uh, you can also have uh, just the bottom bound and say, whatever you do is going to cost at least that. You say, well, if I'm going to sort n numbers, it's going to cost at least uh, a linear amount of time because I have to look at all of them. I can't sort the n numbers without looking at what they are, so it's going to be at least linear. And so you do that uh, by uh, removing this part and keeping only this part. And we call this uh, omega instead of O. That. So omega, you only keep this. Uh, and O, you only keep this. And theta, you keep both. With a big theta, g of n is both an upper bound and a lower bound for f of n. With a big O, it is just an upper bound. With a big omega, it is just a lower bound for f of n. But all these bounds uh, can be reached by f of n. So f of n uh, can have exactly the same growth rate as g of n or smaller in the case of big O. Uh, in the case of big omega, can have f of n can have the exact same growth rate of g of n or greater. And in the case of the big theta, it will have exactly the same growth rate as g of n, since it's bounded by it both above and below. Sometimes you might want to have a uh, strict inequality between the two growth rates and have a variant of this big O where f of n is dominated by g of n but can never reach the growth rate of g of n. And this is actually called the small o. Now how would I write an equivalent definition uh, for the small o? I could imagine that just taking this formula and changing this inequality from less than or equal to just less than would produce the small o. And that would be a mistake. Why? Uh, let's let's make this definition, which will be incorrect. Small o of g of n, and here I just put less than, and otherwise it's the same. Let's take the example of an f1 of n equal to n to the 1.99. Now, this function uh, is big O of n squared. It's dominated. Its growth rate is dominated by that of n squared. Uh, and it is also small o of n squared. It is strictly dominated by the growth rate of n squared. If, however, I take this other function, f2 of n, equal one-half uh, 
of n squared, then this one is big O of n squared. It does not exceed the growth rate of n squared, but with the definition I have there in red, it is also small o of n squared, which I don't like because it should be small o of n squared uh, only if the growth rate of the F2 were strictly smaller than the growth rate of uh, the G of n, which it isn't because it's the same. So why does this happen? It happens because if I, if I try um, going through this definition, then um, there certainly exists n0 and c2 such that from a certain point onwards the f of n is strictly smaller than g of n. In fact, if I, if I look at these two functions, it's obvious that uh, if I just take uh, c2 equal 1, and therefore I write uh, 1 half n square is less than n square. That's true for every, for every n, every value of n. Uh, I don't have to go very far to the right to find something that uh, satisfies this, and, and also I, I can get this for free. Uh, so this inequality is satisfied always, but the semantics are wrong. So that is not, not a good definition for um, the small o. To give a good definition for the small o, I must make sure that I'm not comparing the value of the functions, but the growth rate. And for that I have to say, uh, g of n is trying to bound f of n from above, uh, and there's a constant factor in front of g of n. Now, no matter how bad this constant factor c2, no matter how bad means, no matter how small, g of n will ultimately always be able to overtake f of n because g of n has a higher, a strictly higher growth rate than f of n. So I must uh, rearrange the quantifiers over here and put something in front that says uh, I would have to put something before here that says for all uh, c2 or I, I could even call it epsilon to indicate that it's uh, it could be very small. No matter how small a C2, there will always exist an N0, and never mind C2 because I mentioned it earlier, such that uh, for all N greater than N0, then um, this uh, function F of N is dominated by C2 G of N, even if G of N is penalized by a very small C2 because Giovanni will ultimately win because of its superior growth rate. So, this is uh, written more neatly over here. f of n is smaller of Giovanni, if and only if for all c2, no matter how small, uh, there exists an n0 such that from there onwards, then f of n is dominated by c2 g of n. And I can do the same operation for the big omega to make sure that uh, with uh, any arbitrary c1, even if I make a very big c1, g of n will always be smaller than f of n um, as I go towards plus infinity, because the growth rate of g of n is strictly less than that of f of n.